Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. Well, I'm excited this morning. Pastor Tim uh, McNamee from Blue Tassel Farms is going to be ministering to us this morning. Uh, Pastor Rick and Sherry are on vacation. Uh, Pastor Tim is the missionary at Blue Tassel. I'm sure he's going to talk a bit more about that. I had the opportunity to uh, sit with him and his family at uh, lunch just earlier in the week. Was that this week or last week? Uh, and Nicholas is hilarious. I don't know if you've ever seen his grand, grandson. If, you, if, you, if you're a people watcher, that's good people to watch. It's Nicholas. <laughs> so please, please bring a warm welcome to Pastor Tim. Um, who remembers the Hoosier Dome? Anybody remember the Hoosier Dome? Who remembers this? I know one guy. Well, who remembers Texas Stadium, the original Texas Stadium in, in Irving? So, so long before, now, long before those places uh, became so famous, I'm, I'll tell you a quick little story before I preach. Long before Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison and Reggie and all, and all those guys made the Hoosier Dome famous, there were three other men that made it famous. It was Tim McNamee, Ron Klan, and Troy Love. Some of you probably know Troy Love. But back be- right before they built, they finished the Hoosier Dome, became the RCA Dome, the three of us on our senior day decided that we would, this is bad for parenting, okay? We skipped class, and we went to Indianapolis, and we, we well, okay, we broke in, but the gate was halfway open. How many know if the gate's halfway open, you're allowed to go in, right? So we went in, and we ran the entire arena around that entire place. Just one of those things we wanted to do as seniors. And then long before Emmett and Troy and Michael Irvin made Texas Stadium so famous, I stood on the star on the 50-yard line. Long before they were there, I was there. But both of those places are gone. Both of those places are history. Both of those places have been imploded. You got that video ready? And then back in 2000, another thing happened. Who knows what that place was? Market Square Arena. Another childhood playground for me. Where I grew up, where my dad took me to my first professional basketball game. Market Square Arena, where the Indiana ABA Pacers played. Back in, who remembers back in those days? I'm, when I come and preach, don't always take you back in time, because that's when it was good, man. It was good back then. So about 20 years ago, they destroyed Market Square Arena. Now it's just a big old empty parking lot. And when, we, when that happened, I remember we had a class at our church of master's commission students, and they were graduating, and we were getting ready to send them out into the world. We were, we were sending young people out, although they were trained and called into the world's ministries, we knew that we were sending them out into elements, and we were sending them out into the devil's territory, and he was hell-bent on taking them out, these young people just starting their life of ministry, like we have a a young youth pastor coming in, just starting his life of ministry. And how many know the devil's waiting on him? He's going to need us. How many know the devil's waiting on our teenagers and our young people as they graduate high school and they go into college? The devil's waiting on them. He's already been messing with them, but now he's really waiting on them when they get outside the wings of their parents and the protection. So today I want to talk to you about this. The title of the message, as you see, is The Art of Implosion. City of Indianapolis imploded a state landmark and in turn obliterated one of my childhood playgrounds, Marcus Square Arena. I saw some of the greatest things I've ever seen there. The ABA Pacers, the NBA Pacers. I saw the Harlem Globetrotters for the first time. Just blew my mind when I was a kid. But today I want to talk about avoiding implosion in our own lives. See, I believe the devil gets more pleasure from us destroying ourselves than anything that he could do externally to us. In other words, he delights in implosion more than explosion. He'd like to take you down from the inside out. 
And his voice acts as the C4 explosive. You know what an explosive C4 is. His voice acts as the C4 explosive in our lives. And so does anybody else hear voices besides me? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what I thought. We hear voices all the time, don't we? And so I want you to see four things that we will need to do in order to keep from imploding, for us to keep from destroying ourselves. And it's all about voices. It's all about voices. When that movie came out and the little kid said, I see dead people, I hear voices. That's happening every day to every one of us. We may not be seeing dead people, I hope you're not, but we are hearing voices. And voices will constantly be there to challenge us. And so we need to make sure that we have those voices under control. So the first voice we're going to talk about is our own voice or your voice. And then we'll talk about the voice of others, the devil's voice, and then ultimately the voice of God. These are the four voices that we need to deal with on a daily basis. It's not good enough just for the building to fall. It must fall by design in a certain way. So when they implode these buildings, there's a, there's a plan. You saw that as the explosives went off. Remember this, while a good strategy means While a good strategy makes for a good offense, an exposed strategy makes for a good defense. So a good strategy says, we're going to take this building down. We have to put people and places and explosives in the right places just at the right time. They got to go off. They got to fire in sequence. There's a certain way this building has to come down or it'll destroy the things around it. So the definition of implosion may be the single best definition I've ever heard for Satan's plan for our life. Listen to what the definition is of implosion. It is the destruction of an established entity by a skilled manipulator of power. Let that sink in for a second. The definition of implosion is the destruction of an established entity by a skilled manipulator of power. That's the devil's plan for our life. He is a skilled manipulator of power. He intends to destroy us from the inside out. Listen close to me. The devil has an implosive plan just for you. Just for you. Every single building, the three that I told you about, the Hoosier Dome, Texas Stadium, and Market Square Arena, none of them were imploded the very same way. Every single one of them being unique in their own structure, the devil has a unique plan for that structure. Every one of us has a unique and different structure. We're all human beings, but we're all made the same in a lot of ways, but we're all different in a lot of ways. Something that takes you down might not take me down. Something that takes me down might not take you down. We have strengths and weaknesses, different places. But the devil has an intentional plan for each and every person sitting in this room. Each and every person that he's trying to destroy. But the good news is this. God has an explosive plan for us today to expose the devil and to make sure that the the explosion of God in our life, the joy of God in our life, the love of God in our life. Nathan just said it. We're not just going to love on ourselves on the church picnic. We're going to share that love. We want to explode into our community, explode into our neighborhoods, explode into our families where we have lost people. See, in order to hear the voice of God, you have to deal with the other three first. Curtis Shelby said this, if God has spoken, why is the universe not convinced? And the answer is this, we haven't dealt with the other three. If God has spoken, why aren't we all convinced? If Jesus died for everyone, why not isn't everyone saved? It's not on him, it's on us. The answer is on us because we have not received it. Turn to the book of Romans chapter one. We're gonna look at verse 11 first. How many love the word of God? Amen? I'm excited about the word of God every time I get a chance to open it. People wanna say all the time, well, how do you know you're hearing from God? Well, I don't know that I always hear his audible voice, but I know if I want to hear from him, all I got to do is open that book because he wrote it, right? We're not giving credit to men for this book. We're giving credit to men for, for being obedient to put the ink to paper, but they didn't write it. They didn't, they didn't give the words to it. God inspired every single word. So we ought to be excited every time we open the word of God. And if we want to hear from God, we ought to make sure that we open the word of God. Because you can pray sometimes all day long to your blue in the face. God, if you'll just give me a sign, if you'll just show me, if you'll just do this. And a lot of times he's just like, won't you just open my book? It's all in there. It's all in there. 
So God has a plan for us. He has an explosive plan for us. He wants to establish us. Look at what it says in Romans 1 and verse 11. It says, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. He wants us to be established. He wants us to be, our structure to be strong. See, Paul had the same anxiety for his brothers and sisters in the Roman church. He wanted them to be strong. He wanted them to be established so that when the destroyer comes to plant his poison, we can stand up under his implosive plan with an explosive plan from God to destroy him, to put him under our feet. Look what it says in verse 12. That is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. See, established means to achieve permanent and to settle achieve permanence and to settle so so we need to settle some things today let's look at these issues number one in order to hear God's voice and avoid implosion you must stop listening to your voice this is going to be kind of a contradictory message today because I'm speaking to you and I'm going in a minute I'm going to tell you not to listen to me you speak to yourself. I want you to speak life into yourself. I want you to speak life into your spouse and your family. But at the same time, sometimes we have to stop listening to ourselves. We have to stop listening to these, this voice that we have inside of our head. A lot of good things can come out of us, but we don't usually deal with the things that are still up in here and the things that are deep in here. We don't always let those things come out. In other words, the devil doesn't have to work very hard or even at all on some of, the, some of us to fall into a place of sin that God doesn't want us to be. A thing that begins to plant an explosion or an implosion in our lives. Our sinful nature is on constant active duty. You know that, right? Your sinful nature never sleeps. You think you got rest last night? Your sinful nature was planning against you the entire night. But the good news is that God, the creator of your life, is also planning for you. He is also working in you. Our flesh wants what it wants, when it wants. Turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. We have to be careful listening to our own voice because we will convince ourselves right into sin and then we'll justify that very same th sin. I put on Facebook, I had, you know how Facebook will give you a memory of a year ago or whatever and it popped up a memory for me. And, I, and, and it said, and I don't know why I had it that day, but it, it said something to the effect that no matter how many people that you get to agree with you, sin is still sin. You can try to justify it. You can try to do whatever you want to do, no matter, and you can try to get everybody on board because we think if we can get more people to believe the way we want to or whatever, then it justifies it. But sin is sin. And there's, it doesn't matter how many people you get on your side. There's a lot of people that have people on their side in the sin element. It just doesn't matter. Sin is sin. And we've got to deal with it. We've got to deal with our voices. We've got to deal with the voice of others. We've got to deal with the devil's voice. And ultimately, dealing with those, we deal with the voice of God to make it clear, to clear the path. Look what it says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This ought to be a verse that we probably quote every day. To deny ourselves what our voice says that we deserve, what our voice says that we want, what we think we deserve, what we think we want. Aren't you glad you don't get what you deserve? Because if God gave us everything that we deserve, we'd be in some serious trouble. Thank you for the grace of God. Verse 24 says, for whoever wants to save his own life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? So what is he saying? Self or our own voice, which is driven by our flesh, is tainted and cannot be trusted. Do you know that the Bible teaches us that we shouldn't trust ourselves, we shouldn't trust others, we shouldn't trust anybody except God. Nobody is 100% trustworthy except for God. Nobody. Remember that God has an explosive plan for your life. He wants to see you explode into life. But the devil's trying to get you to implode, to collapse under the pressures that he puts on you through your flesh and through your own voice. He tries to convince you through your own voice that you deserve something. Tries to convince you through your own voice that you're righteous. Tries to convince you through your own voice that nobody's looking. Flesh 
and senses, send messages to our mind, and we have to be ready for that. We're not taken by surprise. You guys know the word. You know that it's going to mess with your mind. That's why Joyce Meyer wrote the book, what? Battlefields of the Mind. It all starts there. Technology has poisoned our flesh even more, making it harder to crucify our flesh. Don't we have some kind of seminar or teaching coming up on technology, on phones and the damage that they do and, and, and uh, video games and which ones cause us to, to act a certain way? I think Pastor Rick announced that maybe on Wednesday night. We live in a society where images and voices, they influence everything. that with you. They come from everywhere. They come from all over. From every direction, no one, no generations have ever lived in what we're living in today. It wasn't that long ago when cell phones couldn't do what they do today. I've got mine right here. I got my Bible on here. I got my clock on here because Pastor Rick told me I, what, what time I have to stop. So I'll make sure I got my clock right here. I didn't have my clock last time I preached. Just being honest. But we are on technology overload. I'm as guilty as anyone. It's right here. I love this thing, man. I can make my Bible any size that I want. I can have any version that I want. I can communicate with my family and people, missionaries across the world. It's great, but we're on technology overload and we're watching it destroy our lives and our children and our children's children even. We're on technology overload where we've got, you know, it, it's been going on for a while from the telegraph to now. We got telegraph, television, telephone, telewoman. I mean, any way you want to get the word out. I said it pretty fast because I was scared. <laughs> but to all the hostile women out there now, let me read you this. Of the book of Romans, you don't have to turn there, but let me read it for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what their nature desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Does anybody else struggle with that except for me? How do we keep our minds set on all the spiritual things when the world is attacking us with every other kind of fleshly temptation? It goes on to say the mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. I mean, openly hostile? Like cursing God? No. The very fact that we allow our sinful mind to take control means that we become hostile to a holy and pure God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. The voice in your mind is full of sin. The only way it can benefit you is if it is under the control of the Spirit. So that's why the Bible says in Galatians, if we walk by the spirit, we will not give in to the temptation of the flesh. But you have to walk by the spirit. It's got to be something you're pumping into your mind 24-7, 24-7. You say, Pastor Tim, can I, I can't go out and have fun. I can't go play golf at your tournament. Can't just have a good time. Yeah, you can go out and have a good time. I'm not saying you can't have fun. I'm not saying you can't uh, watch a good movie. I'm not saying you can't listen to good music. What I'm saying is, make sure that when the evil starts to creep in, when the evil starts to uh, push its way through a movie that you want to see that you know you shouldn't, when evil starts to push into an activity that, man, it seems good on the surface, but you know that there's something wrong there, that's when the spirit has to take control and you have to step back and say, that's not for me. Three ways to identify this voice I don't want to give you today. Three ways to identify this voice. When it tells you you deserve what sin has to offer, you can be sure to crush that voice. It's your own voice trying to convince yourself that it's okay. When it tells you you deserve what sin has to offer. I work hard. I do this. I deserve it. Number two, when it tells you the... To only look out for number one, you can be sure that that is not a voice you want to listen to. Never does God intend for us just to look out for ourselves, get what we want out of something. He wants us to look forward to somebody else. You put others before yourself. We taught the kids for 
ever in the inner city, the word joy, and we said it a lot every week. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. When you get yourself first, joy ain't joy anymore. It's yah ye or something like that. So number two, when it tells you to only look out for number one. Number three, when it tells you God won't care just this one time. Those are voices and those are things that you can identify and know that you need to crush your own voice to rebuke yourself. The second voice that we must deal with to avoid implosion is the voice of others. While it's true that God speaks through Christians, do you know that so does the devil? Well-intentioned Christians that aren't sinning or doing anything wrong. They're just trying to help or they're trying to to get you through a moment or whatever. But listen to me, this is important because a lot of people may struggle with this. It's important that you develop a discerner. And the discerner means to recognize. Turn to the book of Acts chapter 21. Lots of scripture today. An old preacher told me a long time ago before I started a church, he said, I want to give you a word of advice. He said, when you're preaching, make sure half of your words are scripture. And then you'll be sure that half of your words are right. It's true, right? Sometimes I'd rather just get up here and read the Bible. No responsibility. It's all on him. He wrote it, not me. Acts chapter 21, verse 10 says, After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Now look at what it says next. It says, When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of Jesus Christ. These are, these are Paul's friends. These are people that love Paul. I, I would hope that if my life was in danger, people would come to me and say, Pastor Tim, don't go there. The prophets already prophesied that you're going to be beaten, maybe killed. My friends that love me ought not to want me go. Now, if they just say, yeah, you need to go on, you, need, you should go. I think that's a good idea. Go ahead, Pastor Tim. I know you might die, but go ahead. We're flesh. We love each other. We want the best for each other. Sometimes we don't know the things of God. And Paul, Paul is adamant. He's like, why are you doing this? Why? You know what he says? Why are you breaking my heart? They were loving him. They didn't want him to die. But Paul had a different perspective. Because Paul knew that the prophet represented the voice of God in his life. And the prophet said, you're going to go here. And this is what's going to happen to you. And Paul said, you know what? I'm good with that because it came from God. I'm not just willing to be beaten and in prison, but I'm willing to die for him. People have good intentions. If one of you comes to me today and asks for advice, I'm going to give you advice. But like I preached to you the last couple of times I was here, you better make sure it lines up with the voice of God in your life. I'm going to do the best I can to interpret your situation or the scripture or whatever it might be and tell you what I think. Sometimes God just tells me to shut up. And I have to say to people, let me pray on that and get back to you. But Paul, he's not dismayed by the message. I'm sure that in his, his, his bed that night, he's like, God, I don't want to die. I don't want to be beaten. I don't know anybody that wants to be beaten. But if that's what you say needs to happen. So good intention, well-intentioned people will, will use their voice in your life. It's still up to you to discern. Does that match, match up with everything I've known? Does that match up with my own prayer life? Does that match up with what God's showing me? Does it match up with scripture? Because just because he's a pastor or just because he's an evangelist or just because of this or that or he's got a great reputation or whatever it might be, he's not God. None of us are God. And good intentioned people, don't let them talk to you into a place or out of a place God wants you. I always say this about people that leave churches and I'm not a pastor anymore of a congregation so I'm a little freer to say it. But if God called you to a church, it's only God that can lead you out of it. Not a person, not a man, not a woman. 
God gives the calling. And God will speak to you about it. He'll speak to others about it that might speak to you. He might speak to the pastor to speak to you. But it's still on you to process the voices. Remember all those voices? It's still on you as a child of the living God to process the voices. A prophet warns him his friends try to persuade him with everything they have because they love him. I want want you to go back to the book of Acts if you can with me. Acts 20. I'm more sensitive now when I have my device and I'm trying to follow along with the pastor. I'm like, I wish he would slow down. I got, I'm trying to get there. So I'm going to slow down a little bit for you. Acts chapter 20, verse 22, and it says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task of the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now, isn't that guy cool? I mean, that's great, right? That's not so easy to achieve. It's not so easy to say, no matter what, I'll go wherever. I mean, we like to say that. Here I am, Lord, send me. And we see these verbal statements made through scripture and people might make them from a pulpit like I'm at today, but then you don't see the turmoil that might happen as that person drives home today. When they come to the altar and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And then they realize... I just said, I'll do whatever he asked me to do. And then they've got to go to sleep that night. And then they've got to wake up the next day. And then they've got to wait on the process. And they don't know what the process is, just like Paul does sometimes. I'm willing to go to that foreign country, God. I don't know what the process is, but I'm willing to go. And then fear begins to creep in. And without the strong spirit of God in your life, that's the voices that the devil will use. You can't go to India. Who do you think you are? You don't, how are you going to get the money? All kinds of doubt, just like our last missions team. I'm sure some of them faced doubt. We heard them stand up here and testify about the goodness of God, but I don't believe that they didn't face doubt. And some of them can probably testify to that. His friends had good intentions, but they didn't line up with God's intentions. In Galatians chapter 2, Verse 11 through 14, I'm just going to read this for you. Peter leads Barnabas astray after being convinced and influenced by other Christians. This is Peter. Was anybody closer to Jesus than Peter? He leads him astray. Still, other things happen. You don't believe me? In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 21, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You know what happened? Good old Peter, closer to Jesus than anybody, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You don't think that the enemy will use Christians? Says he took Peter. Peter. And he took Jesus aside and rebuked him and said, never, Lord, he said, that shall never happen to you. Now, here's my proof that God will use or Satan will use Christians to detour us. The next verse, Jesus says of himself, get behind me, Satan. Who influenced Peter? According to Jesus, Satan did. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Peter is a prime example of what I'm saying today about our own voices. We can get distracted. We can have the enemy creep in and try to convince us of things, even with good intentions. He's a subtle serpent. He's sneaky. Peter had good intention, but Jesus had God intentions. Both, both Jesus and Paul were ready to die. You want a secret? Neither one of them wanted to. Neither one of those men wanted to die. Jesus said, is there any other way, Dad? I know there's no other way, son. A little time went by. He said, hey, Dad, is there any other way? He said, no, son, there's no other way. Then he said, I'm willing. Paul must have been on his knees many times saying, God, is there any other way that I have to be beaten 
and imprisoned and mocked and spit on? Is there any other way? Makes you wonder whatever it is that you're doing for God, if it came with those kind of qualifications that you would step up and do it. Now, God, I'd like to start this farm out here. And he said, well, you can, but people are going to beat you and spit on you. And you might die. Would I have been so quick to sign up? The voice of the enemy. Man, am I doing good on time. Did you hear that, Pastor Rick? I am on it, baby. It's 11.01. Listen, there will be times when people tell you they have a word from the Lord for you. And that is perfectly valid and scriptural. It's valid and scriptural. I think Pastor Rick even talked about that Wednesday night. It's called a word of knowledge or a word of prophecy. But you must be careful. They are called words of knowledge, words of wisdom, words of prophecy. Now listen closely. No matter who gives you the word, no matter how good their track record, make sure it is confirmed by the Holy Spirit in you. You'll get a check in your spirit right away if you're living a spiritual life. And you don't have to rebuke that person if you don't feel like that they're right on or they don't know what's going on. Just receive it. But you process it. It's your decision. Make sure it's confirmed by the Holy Spirit in you. Or just thank them and set it aside until it is. Maybe it is the word it has for you. But it's just not the right timing. When you walk in that spiritual life, that's when you're going to be able to process those things. He will speak to you. I believe that he will speak to every believer. When you got saved, the spirit of God took up residency in you. I'm not against prophets and things like that, but I got to tell you something. If he's not speaking to me, I got to figure out why. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead resides in each one of us. The same spirit that speaks to a prophet or an evangelist or a preacher resides in every person. And we know that preaching and teaching and evangelizing, those are good things. Those are God things. That's what he tells us to do. But I want to tell you something. If you're looking for answers, look to hear from him first before you look to hear from us. You're worthy of that. You're his child. You're his creation. And he lives inside of you. Third thing, the third voice that you must deal with to avoid implosion is the voice of the devil. We've dealt with our own voice. We've dealt with the voice of others, even believers and non-believers, but how about the distinct voice of the devil? This voice can be difficult if you're not a student of the word. That's why it's so important that we're in the word of God every day. If he can't get you to destroy yourself, if he can't get someone else to do it for him, he'll come after you himself. For you, Satan plants thoughts of doubts in your mind, of lust in your flesh, of greed in your hearts. All of this in preparation for your implosion. He is planting the seeds of C4 explosions in strategic places in your life. He's trying to destroy your marriage. He's trying to destroy your children. These are the strategic things. Here are the elements of implosion. Here's what happens. Number one, very slowly, the things that gave you character begin to disappear. For Market Square Arena, July 2000, 7 a.m., I made sure that I was up to watch that. The championship banners that gave it character had been taken down. The scoreboard had been removed. The hardwood floor had been sectioned off and, and auctioned off. It was very strategic. The things that began, that gave it character for all those years, the things that put me in awe every time I walked in and watched and saw all those banners and saw all the lights and saw the biggest basketball court I ever thought I saw in my life, even though it was the same size as I grew up playing on. It just didn't look like it. It was bigger than life. The Elvis memorabilia taken down that had been there from his last performance. Everything, what gave it character, what people raved about, what people talked about, all of it was gone. He begins to attack the things that give you character, number one. For you, it's your devotion time, your prayer time, your serving time. These are the things that are the characteristics of men and women of God. How we serve, how we pray, how we read, how we study. The second thing is this, the destroyer plants his poison strategically. For Market Square Arena, it was in its foundations, in its support beams, in its suspension arms. When you watch the video, those are the things that took the hits. They didn't attack the seating or the floor. 
He's strategic in how he wants to take you out. He's strategic in how he wants to hurt your family. He's strategic in how he wants to take your finances and devour them. And Nathan talked about our giving and and, and, and that, and we know that the tithe is not something for us to play with. But the, the other part about the story of the tithe is that it's not just giving the 10 percent, but it's that 90 percent that God promises he'll rebuke the devourer. So 9 percent ain't going to cut it. The devourer is still coming. Eight and a half percent ain't going to cut it. Always told my church, if you don't give 10 percent, I don't want your dirty money. Because it's tainted. He begins to attack our finances, the things that, that is the very structure of our, our homes. We have to have money to run our homes these days. He attacks the things that are precious to us. The voice, because its attack is calculated, is very specific. He go after everything that means something to you. Family, finances, servanthood, your health. Anybody ever had a health attack? You think the devil's not behind some of that? He'll attack your self-esteem with lies about your worth and about your abilities. It's not hard to hear his voice if you know the truth because it's contrary to everything that you know about the truth. His voice is one of the easiest to discern. If you're a believer and a student of the word, because it immediately contradicts everything you know. But if you submit to God, which we're all called to do, the voice will be diminished by the volume of God's word. You want to tune out the devil? Turn up God. Can I get an amen? You want to tune out the enemy? Turn up God. I'll admit it. There's no, there's no shame in my game. I like music. That's why I take old secular music that I listened to as a kid and I changed the words because I love that tune. Music speaks to me. Music gets me through hard places. That's why God write, helps me write songs. I've got a guitar up in the highest cabin in the woods now just so that whenever I want to go up there and get away and God wants to give me a song, I can go up there and just sing to him or get a new song or whatever it might be. Music speaks to me, but music can also destroy me. Sports speak to me. I always make these. I've preached in here about Hoosiers. I've preached in here about the Milan Miracle. I've preached in here now about Marcus Square Aruna. The, I got a Cincinnati Reds message that'll blow you away. I might bring that next time. But sports can destroy you too. We can get so caught up, and I think I shared this before, but I'll, I'll reference it real quick again. There was a time in my life when I claimed to be a Christian as a young man that if IU or the Cowboys lost, I literally got sick, physically sick, because that had become a God in my life, and it was before God. Is there anything wrong with sports? No, unless you let it become a God in your life. Is there anything wrong with secular music? Not necessarily, unless you let it become a God in your life, and you're listening to inappropriate things. That's why I like to twist that around and give God glory for the, something the devil intended for good. The devil intended for his own good some of the music that we used to listen to, and we turned that around and, and for the glory of God. See, the voice of the devil will be diminished by the volume of God. Volume means quantity. If you, if you go up there on the soundboard, you'll see these sliders up there. And when they slide that up, that's increasing the quantity. His voice is one of deception that blankets the truth of his intentions. His deceiving tongue speaks a foreign language. Jesus exposes it. He rebukes him and the, and the religious leaders in John chapter 8. You don't have to turn there, but he, he tells them very clearly this. He says, why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. It's all the enemy knows how to do is lie. It's all that he knows how to do is to take you to a place God doesn't want you by lying to you. For Market Square Arena, they told the city county building, which is right beside it, it says, it won't affect you, but we'll cover you with a giant blanket just in case. 
And they did. Biggest blanket I've ever seen. And for us, he'll try to convince you it'll be okay to pull a blanket over your eyes and try to get you not to worry about it. You know, if the city county building wasn't worried about it, they'd have been watching from their windows. Can I get an amen? I want to tell you something. There wasn't a person in that building. And it had a blanket on it. He wants us to just turn the other way and, and, and not put into practice, not put into effect the things that we've learned. This would complete his plan, is to get us to cover up our eyes, to look away while he destroys everything that we love. While he implodes our family and our finances and our friends. He just wants us to look away. Put a blanket over it. I'll close with this, now the most important voice of all in order to avoid implosion is hearing the voice of God. How do we hear the voice of God? Here's the key. If you get this today, you'll be hearing God's voice in no time at all. Don't expect God to speak to you in a sensational, spectacular, supernatural, burning bush voice every time. That's all you respond to is if he, if he splits the sea in front of you. It's not that he doesn't do that or that he can't. I'm sure that on occasion he does. And I, I feel like I've experienced that in my life where God just unleashed on me before. But it's not the norm. You know why? Because he lives in you, not just above you. He's not far away that he has to yell or scream. Or give us a miracle every time we need him to do something. We, I need a miracle, God. I just need you to. When I was a teenager and I was struggling with whether I believed in God or not and went to the little Baptist church there in Hope, I remember standing out in front of my mom's house on, in Clifford, Indiana on 250 E Street. I said, all right, God, if you're real, if you're who my mom says you are, then plop me a dragon down right in front of me. Right now, just give me a dragon. I'm 15 and stupid, you know, because if he'd have given me a dragon, I'd have took off down 250 E Street faster than anybody in town. You know, I'm not going to give you a dragon. I'm going to show you how I saved your mom. I'm going to show you how I've saved your brothers and sisters. I'm going to show you miracles through my word. You need to hear my voice. Stop listening to your own voice that says you need a dragon. He lives in us, not just above us. In a vision, in a dream, even in the midst of a storm, he calms us. You're going through something right now and you don't see a way out. Your heart is broken. It's heavy. You're not sure what tomorrow looks like. Remember, the same God that raised Jesus from the dead is in you right now. He's got you. But you got to tap into that. Worship team, if you guys will come on back up. See, it was a still small voice that got Elijah's attention. We have a relationship through our salvation. We have been washed by the blood and we are in communion with God. We have been anointed and sealed I want you to turn to this last scripture as the team gets ready. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll give you a minute to get there. Let me read that for you again. We have a personal relationship with God. Living amongst the Amish as we do now, I've talked to a few of them. And while they have their belief system, the one thing is obvious that they don't have is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They have a hope of salvation. They're the finest people some of them that you'll ever meet. See, we've got something inside of us, something that is real, something that we need to surrender to and access every day. We have a relationship through our salvation. We have been washed by the blood of Jesus. That's good news. And we are in communion with God. That means that we can hear from him, that he listens to us, that he bottles every tear. That's what communion is with God. And we have been anointed and we have been sealed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it says this, 
Now it is God who takes both us and you. Takes both us and you. Stand firm in him. He makes us both. He anointed us. Listen to this. He set his seal of ownership on us. And he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. The church, I, man, I just, I got a few minutes, so I get to reread this. Now it is God. Who? God. Who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us. First of all, it's God who made us. It's God who anoints us. Then he set his seal of ownership on us. He said, you don't have to worry about it. I got you. You belong to me and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit. The spirit of God. Your heart is aching right now for something. It's aching. And in the very same room of your heart is the spirit of God. Ready to take away the ache. But you got to touch it. You got to get a hold of it. You got to remember that it's in you. Don't listen to the lies of people, your own voice or the enemy. The spirit of God, it says it right here is in our hearts. And listen to this word, guaranteeing what is to come. He knows what's going to happen in the next minute, in the next day, in the next month, the next year, in the next decade, in the next century. Nothing gets by him. Someone said to me that they weren't sure if it was God or the devil that they heard. Pastor Tim, how do I know if it's the voice of the enemy or the voice of God. Think about this. Let's parallel them. If it's the devil, it'll be condemning thoughts. If it's God, it'll be thoughts that build you up. If it's the devil, it'll be contrary to the Bible. If it's God, it will always line up with the Bible. If it's the devil, he will try to give you what you want. If it's God, he'll give you what you need. The devil wants you to have all you deserve. (laughs) Jesus paid the price so you wouldn't get any of what you deserve. The devil wants you to be with him. So does God. See, the only thing that they have in common is that they both want you. They both want me. You stand to your feet this morning. Nathan's picked the perfect song if he's true to his schedule he gave me. Are we doing I Surrender? Because the only way to process the voices that are in your life every day, and none of them, listen to me, none of them are going away. (laughs) None of them are going away. Your voice is not going away. We just have to control it better. The voice of our friends and the voice of people that want to destroy us are not going anywhere. We have to control it by the Spirit. The voice of the devil is certainly not going anywhere because you've heard more truth today. You've processed more truth. Now he knows he's going to have to work harder, so he's going to lie harder because that's all he knows how to do is lie. That's not going away. And the one constant voice you can count on to always be right and always be true is God's. And the only way that we can process all those voices is to surrender to him. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.